right. Well, next, we have our keynote speaker. Eric Balchunas is Senior ETF Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, where he leads the ETF and passive fund research and com contributes to Bloomberg Opinion. He is a frequent speaker at industry events and conferences, as well as public events now and conferences, and uh, is also the co-creator of the Bloomberg podcast Trillions and Bloomberg's TV's ETF IQ. He's the author of two books. The first was the Institutional ETF Toolbox, and the second is this one, The Bogle Effect. Fantastic book. I think he really captures everything here. So not only what Jack did for all of us, but what he's doing for the entire industry, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. So with no further ado, let me introduce Eric Balchunas. Thank you, Rick. Tough act to follow, I got to say. I think that should have been the headliner. Uh, <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so as, as Rick said, I'm an, e I'm an analyst, right? So this presentation is going to contain a lot of data. What I did in my book was try to trace out the immense impact that this one individual and company have had. Um, before I go into that in my PowerPoint, I just want to give a, a few uh, thanks, first of all, to Rick Ferry, Christine Benz, and Jim Wyant for inviting me here. I've been communicating with them for a while, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. Obviously, uh, this is like a home game, I guess, for this book. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be preaching to the choir up here. When I give this presentation to the industry, not everything goes over so well. <laughs> also, shout out to Jim and Connor for pulling all that tech off. I saw all that. That is not easy. <laughs> Seriously, that's like high level right there. You could do a rock concert next. I want to thank the Bogleheads, all of you. I've been meeting a lot of you. It's been great. Um, and the Bogleheads Forum, I have a funny story about that. I, when I was writing the book, I wanted to interview some individual Vanguard investors. And so I went on the Bogleheads org, created an account, and put a post up that said, hey, if anybody wants to be interviewed for this book about Jack Bogle, you know, let me know. And so a couple days ago, I don't see any replies. I'm like, oh, OK, I guess nobody cared. Then I get an email from Lady Geek over there saying I had been banned. <laughs> I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, well, you can't solicit anything. Although if we let you do this, there's gonna be 100 people. And as I said in the book, I actually respected that. I think keeping the purity of that forum is unusual. There's so much advertising all over. This event and that forum have a purity that you don't see very often. And you have to work pretty hard to keep that going. So thank you for that. Um, let me get going with the PowerPoint here. OK, so there's the book. I spent about two years re researching this book. Um, it wasn't easy. When you write a book, you have to want to say it. You have to really want to say it. Almost like if you don't say it, you're going to be carrying around a weight. And that is what I felt with this. Because you're going to have to live on the planet of that topic. So I was like on Planet Bogle for two years. Um, and just exploring it, and as an analyst, it made me better. I really learned a lot in the process, and I interviewed 50 people for this book. I wanted it to appear like a semi-documentary and bring in voices uh, to the book, such as Michael Lewis, Jason Zweig, Gus Sauter, even Warren Buffett participated, which was a shocker because I, I was trying to get a hold of Warren Buffett's email, which isn't easy, and I go to Bloomberg TV, and I'm like, can I get Warren Buffett's email? They're like, uh, no. So... I then went to an anchor who I know well. She got it for me on the down low, and she sent me the file that they keep on Buffett, and all the notes are, it's for like reporters who want to email him. It's like, he will never get back to you. You are nothing. You should not even ask. And I was like, oh, this is, this is not going to go well. So I emailed the email, and I said, hi, Warren. I'm writing this book on Jack Bogle. Here's my five questions. He replied within like, I don't know, eight, nine hours, like within that day. I was stunned. I was like, wow. And obviously, it wasn't because of me. Um, he said, and I quote, I'm very swamped, but I'll always help out on a couple items for Jack. So 
Uh, that was nice because I got to put Buffett on the liner of the book, which hopefully helped sell, sell a few copies. Um, I have a quote from him in the book, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay, um, the reason I wrote the book was because I wanted to, but also this picture. This is a picture of my desk. So on the left side, there's this cup that is my son made in, like when he was in second grade. In that cup is pens, pencils, and a dictaphone. For anybody here under 40, which there aren't many, uh, that's what we used to record people on. That joke goes over better at different places. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think that through. Okay. That's an accumulator joke. Okay. All right. <laughs> so anyway, I'm looking at that dicta, or the dictaphone's looking at me, and it's just bothering me because I know I have three and a half hours of Jack Bogle interview, just he and I. I interviewed him three times. Each time I walked in, it was like an instant debate. This guy was fired up, feisty. He had papers flying all over his office. He wanted to talk about how ETFs suck, and like he had all these points to make. And I looked at it, and he, in the last interview, he said a lot of things about the future. He was very prophetic. And I thought, yeah, I, I got to get this on paper. Plus, I had been in the data seeing how intense Vanguard's impact has been over the last seven, eight years in particular. And where I work in research, the people who cover asset managers only cover publicly traded ones like BlackRock and Goldman. They don't cover Vanguard because they're private. So I'm always amazed at how little people in my industry actually know about this company and how unique it is. So I thought it was also a good vehicle to explore different areas like funds, ETFs, advisory business, trading, behavior. The Bogle effect is way bigger than it looks. And so I try to capture it in the book. Um, here's a picture of me and Jack. I like this picture because it's with Jack and I'm 20 pounds later. <laughs> this was before I, the COVID-19 pounds that I developed. Um, I'm trying to get back there, but I like going to his office. When I went into his office, I was I felt like I was in my grandmother grandfather's house. He had oil paintings. The vibe in there was very um, World War II generation. And you know, back to Taylor, you know, I actually dedicated the book to my grandparents and the World War II generation because I feel like that character is very present in Bogle's life and, and the story, and it just felt right to do. And so we had we had you know a lot of good debates, a lot of rich material that I tried to marry with the data. So without further ado, let's go over 10 takeaways from my book. These are th things that I discovered or big points I try to make throughout the book. The first one is that indexing needed Vanguard way more than Vanguard needed indexing. Index funds get way too much credit for the index fund revolution, in my opinion. I uh, basically estimate that if Bogle and Vanguard had not happened, um, index funds would exist. As you know, he didn't invent them, right? They were going to happen one way or another, but they would have 5% of the assets they have today. They're only a big hit because they're cheap, and they're only cheap because of the mutual ownership structure. The mutual ownership structure is the thing. That is the change agent. That structure plus Bogle's structure to me are the two things that combine to create the explosion that we're seeing rippling through markets. Index funds got lucky. They got lucky that this happened right as they were coming out. That said, they were a match made in heaven, right? Um, and here's a quote from one of Jack's books where he talks about meeting John Lovelace in the airport right after forming Vanguard in 74. Lovelace says this, this is two years before the index fund comes out from Vanguard and actually three or four months before Bogle even reads the article that gave him the idea for the index fund. This is purely based on the structure because Lovelace knew that if, if you have a mutual structure, you will be bringing a gun to a knife fight because you'll constantly be able to lower fees, and that's a major advantage. So that's, I think, one proof point. Another one is, if you look at this chart, this is the chart of the um, active fees over time and the Vanguard fee over time. They both kind of started from the same spot. The active one went up because the normal gravity in this industry is to make money. It's a business. I don't fault people. I would have done the same thing. I said it over in the book. Uh, Bogle was just weird. Uh, that's what the whole, that's, that's why this book is about this guy. Everybody else would have done the same thing, right? But you notice um, when it comes down, that's when Vanguard started to get popular. So they only changed when Vanguard got something going. And the fees coming down, you notice it happened inch by inch. It's not like it came out at 10 basis points, right? And this is important because some, pe some people say, well, what about, what if Vanguard never existed? Schwab would have had a free index fund, don't you think? I'm like, yeah, maybe somebody would have come out with like a gimmicky, free index fund, but they would have got you somewhere else. 
They would have upsold you on something or used your money in, in a cash account and made more money on it, pay for order flow. They would have had to make money somewhere else. What makes Vanguard unique is there is no other thing. It's just an organic low cost, but it took a long time, but it paid off in the end. And here's another chart that I think proves this is there are plenty of index funds that are not cheap, right? Here's a list of index funds that have pretty high fees, like 25 to uh, 80 basis points. And the one I highlight there is the Wells Fargo fund, which Bogle hated. That was the second one launched, which some people said was the first. Uh, he even said, even our damn lawyers say that's the first one. Um, yeah. No, he, like I said, I was, I was shocked at how fired up he was uh, when I met him uh, in his 80s. So that Wells Fargo fund was the second one, and it's 44 basis points, and that's with Vanguard. So you can imagine it's probably 80 or 90. My theory is that index funds would have been something for institutions or fans of the efficient market hypothesis. The big thing and what's sweeping over the, the nation and taking in all the flows is low cost. That's really, he should be the father of low cost investing, in my opinion. I think index funds not quite accurate. And let's say, in, here's another chart. This is amazing. So Vanguard is the third biggest active fund manager with 1.2 trillion. This was mentioned on the panel earlier with Alec, Lucas, and Ben Johnson. This is with Bogle dumping on active for like 40 years. Think about that. That's despite that, right? So you realize the reason that's big is because they're so low cost. So imagine if there were no indexing and Bogle was positive towards active, but they were low cost, I think they'd be the biggest active manager six times over if indexing wasn't a concept. Because as the studies show, the cheaper active is, the more it outperforms over long term. This is a great Morningstar study that clearly shows that correlation, right? Your beat rates go up the cheaper you are. Vanguard active funds would have risen to the top over the 20, 30 year time frame, and they would have gotten a ton of assets. Another thing that sort of proves this, which I was also shocked by, was if you go back to the early pioneer mutual funds that came out in the 1920s, um, they're now 90 plus years old. Um, I guess Taylor's age. Uh, so they're, they're you know, uh, 94, 95. Anyway, there's 12 of them that came out and only half of them exist today. And the one, the Wellington Fund has 90% of the assets. So that's, I think, a big foreshadow for what would have happened again if no indexing. And I think it foreshadows Vanguard's staying power. Because if Wellington is the last man standing after 90 years, uh, it's, it's a pretty good sign for, again, the power of low cost. And I think also the trust, uh, the trust factor, which was also mentioned in that panel, is an underrated part of this. People just trust Vanguard way more than other companies. Okay, number two, Bogle's mission not yet realized. So this was, I, I read a lot of Bogle's books. I read the rest of them researching this book, and I knew, all, I knew a lot of his famous quotes, right? But I, there was a quote in a book called Character Counts, which again was mentioned on the pa panel earlier. It's one of his most underrated books. It's all the speeches he gave the crew, uh, basically in one book. And here's the quote that I was just like, what? The first sign that Vanguard's mission has created a better world for the investor will be when our market share begins to erode. Okay, I've asked many people this. Have you ever heard of a CEO rooting for their market share to erode? Like that has to be unprecedented. It speaks to the different trip this guy was on. And I, th <laughs> I mean, truly, this is not normal. That's why I tell people, Vanguard, uh, Bogle was weird. That's why I put abnormal up there. In fact, the first time I walked into his office, I'll just take a little side story here. I was, Mike Regan wrote an article about him for Bloomberg Markets, and I wanted to interview him for my first book. And Mike says, oh, here's his email. He'll get right back to you. I'm like, really? I wrote him. He got right back to me. He said, come on over. I walk in and I said, hey, um, it's really abnormal for someone of your stature to be so easy to get a hold of and meet with. And he goes, I'm abnormal in that in more ways, my friend. So this, I think, would qualify as abnormal. But here's the thing, and he also said it in 91 when they had very little market share. Think about the vision and foresight to know they would gather a lot of assets. But of course, this really is him saying, I want my competitors to get cheap because everybody will get a better deal. And the thing is, it hasn't happened yet, right? Vanguard's market share continues to grow. It's well above 25% of all U.S. fund assets. Um, and it's going to grow faster in a bear market. So this year, the market share is going to keep going up because there's no asset or market appreciation to lift others' assets. It's only flows. So I, I, I don't know where this will end. I mean, at some point, it will plateau. We'll see. I think regulation may be the one thing that can stop them. 
The line below is also interesting. That is the share of revenue that Vanguard makes up. It's only 5%. So that gap is extraordinary. I, I don't know if that exists in any other industry, but that 5% gap is obviously why people love Vanguard. And this came up on the panel yesterday, the customer service, I think, is part of why you, the customer service is difficult because you're only making $5 billion on $8 trillion in assets with 30 million investors. It's not a lot of money. Um, and if all the industry earned that $5 billion, the revenue would go from like $140 billion to $20 billion. That's an 80% decline. So I do call this the scariest chart on Wall Street because it foreshadows uh, you know, some pain. I don't think it'll be that bad. I just think there is some reckoning coming for sure. Um, here's a look at Vanguard's flows. This is sort of why I want to write the book. The flows into Vanguard are absurd. So they take in almost a billion a day for the past decade. So that's 2.4 trillion, 2,600 business days, 920 million a day. The next closest is BlackRock with half of that. And BlackRock, we know, is, is also you know, a huge cash getter. Then you need binoculars to see third place. And most people have seen outflows. So this deserves to be studied. I thought, I really need to, it's, I was talking to my colleagues, like, you guys really need to know about this. Um, but it's also just a fascinating business story. This is a company that's just come into its own and is just completely dominating. And if you look at the top 15 biggest mutual funds in the US, or ETFs mutual funds together, the top 10 are now all passive. In fact, the top 11 are passive. Eight of those 11 are vanguards. And the other three are Fidelity, iShares, and um, State Street, who just copied them. So that is sort of the Vanguard effect or the Bogle effect in that even the ones that got cheap are rising. So I guess in Bogle's mission, he would like to see more non-Vanguard funds up there on that list. But my guess is they'll have to get cheap to get up there. Um, this slide is just something, when you go and you're an analyst and you go into different asset classes like bonds, equities, and then you go even further, munis, um, smart beta, it's stunning how much Vanguard dominates these, these subcategories. So in bonds, they have double the bond fund assets of anybody else. And they've got more active bond fund assets. They now manage more active bond fund money than PIMCO. So uh, it, you know, there's some extraordinary numbers here, I think, that I wanted to just point out. But again, uh, we need the competitors to get going. They're, I mean, they all have cheap funds, um, but they're not quite seeing the flows that, that match Vanguard's. Okay, Vanguard wouldn't exist if not for a ton of serendipity. This, I love stories of serendipity. I love business stories like Shoe Dog, the Nike story. I love reading about the fledgling part of a business. And Bogle, you get a ton of that. There's so many points where something happened where you're like, wow, it could have gone the other way. The first one is this one. So he's looking for a thesis to write. You guys all know this. I'm like sort of preaching gospel here, but he is, uh, picks, uh, goes to the library picks up fortune, there's an article on mutual funds in there. Okay, I'll write about that. Well, I went and searched for what other magazines might be lying around the library in December 1949. So Time Magazine was probably there, and on the cover of that was Conrad Hilton. So you have to wonder, what if he picked up this magazine? Would we have low-cost hotels? <laughs> the hotel industry dodged a real bullet there. Okay, another one. When the 60s were booming, Wellington was, not see was seeing outflows, and it was struggling because it was a boring fund. It was very conservative. It was like the era of the last decade where the arcs of the world were doing well. And he wanted to team up with a more an equity manager to give the firm some edge, right? We all know the story. When he went to do this, he was see uh, seeking a middle-of-the-road partner. So Capital Group, they said no. Uh, incorporated Investors said no. Franklin said no. So he had a lot of no's. Then he finds this, this other company up in Boston, Thorndike. They say yes, and you can see Bogle's quote. It wasn't his first choice, but he was desperate. Wanted to do something to turn it around. Uh, as you know, when the 60s fell and the 70s uh, bear market came, they had a huge fight. I mean, they hated each other. I won't go into all the details. You know the story, probably most of you. But you have to wonder, and it was that bifurcation and that constant fighting that they had to come up with a solution. And the solution arguably led to Vanguard, the back office company. But you have to wonder, if he's with Capital Group, they're probably not going to have that bitter, bitter fight, and you probably get no Vanguard. So I guess the moral of the story is if somebody says no, it might not be that bad. Like, it might be leading to something better. 
I think the what's the quote? When one door opens, another or one door closes, another one opens. But again, major serendipity to get uh, to this point. Now, obviously, this is an uncomfortable situation, but I don't think you you have Vanguard without that. The final one, there's three of them, is just reading the Journal of Portfolio Management and having a back office company and Dr. Paul Samuelson basically saying, can somebody please launch an index fund? And he's like, sure, I'll do it. And then obviously he tells the board, this isn't managing money because he, he wasn't allowed to do that yet. And uh, as he told Mike Regan, they actually bought it. Um, so he got that past the board, got that out, and there goes the first index fund. So this is a, an, an amazing amount of serendipity. But a lot of it was, you know, done by somebody who was always fighting and struggling. So I think that's uh, there's a lot of lessons in this book that are beyond just fund and fund investing. I think anybody in business can really get a lot out of this. Um, okay, let's have a little fun. Okay, I think Bogle had a kinship with punk rock. Okay, before I interviewed him, I would see him on CNBC or Bloomberg TV, and he'd be he'd, he'd be pouring cold water on, on the show. Like, like the whole thing's designed around trading. And he'd say, trading is for losers. <laughs> there's all these active managers who think they found a strategy. He'd be like, there's no there there. It doesn't exist. There's no way around the fact that the index fund wins. It's like, oh, gee, welcome. You know, why don't you come back next week? <laughs> I was like, man, this guy's kind of punk. So that wouldn't be enough for me to make the metaphor that I made in the book. I have a little fun with it in the book. There's another layer to this metaphor that get, takes it to another level. And it's this quote from Johnny Ramone. I, I read a book about the history of punk rock. And the Ramones are largely considered with birthing punk, um, ironically, about two weeks after Vanguard was formed. They're both like uh, fall of 1974. Um, anyway, you can see he says, what we did was we take everything out we didn't like about rock and roll. So it's this addition by subtraction. So I think Bogle's life work could be summed up by addition by subtraction. I almost named the book addition by subtraction because he spent 40 years taking out the things that you don't need that get in the way, right? So management fees, uh, the expenses, tra transaction costs, brokers, human bias, right? Emotion. And he's just giving you frictionless exposure. And like punk, which if you listen to the first Ramones album, Again, it sounds exactly the same as it did when you first heard it. It's, it's got a timeless quality to it because there's no fat. And I do think index funds are a bit like that. Um, if you look at this chart, which I think Bogle used very well to sell indexing to a country that is used to uh, wanting winners. So he had to be very creative in selling it. And this is a chart showing the growth of $10,000 if you uh, get 7% or 5%. And the 2% the would be the fees and all the friction in between, and the difference over 50 years is astronomical, right? So to me, this was his big, I think, life's work, is to slowly and methodically move, remove all of that stuff uh, so that you can have frictionless exposure. Um, another punk thing he did was not paying brokers. Uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier in the panel as well. It reminded me of Michael Corleone in The Godfather when the senator comes for a handout for like a licensing fee or something, and he's like, my offer is this, nothing. This was really ballsy in the 70s. I mean, now it's, there's a lot of no-load funds, but to not pay a broker at that time was hugely, it's just gonna delay your growth. And I found this over and over in Bogle's story. They wouldn't take short-term money. He did things constantly that would push back the growth. And I, I give him credit for that. He had a very long-term vision that is very rare. and. Vanguard's flows in that time did, were not good, right? Wellington's funds were all seeing outflows. It probably would have been easier to just pay brokers, get with the program, and get these flows back. So they had 80 straight months of outflows before finally in 1979 seeing some inflows. Now I'm, they probably haven't seen uh, a quarter of outflows since. Um, but again, I find that to be you know uh, just a really brave move. And that move is why this chart is just shocking. 97% of Vanguard's assets came after Bogle stepped down as CEO. Uh, you know, I looked at Apple, 83% of Apple's market cap came after Steve Jobs left. So 97% is pretty unprecedented. But it speaks to the fact that all these hard choices to delay the growth, once, the, once that fund got below 10 bips and the internet hit and a bunch of other catalysts came around, 
it just shot off like a cannon. But he really toiled around in obscurity. This is a chart I show. I interviewed Brad Kutsuyama. Uh, he's the Flash Boys guy. And he's, uh, he's struggling. I mean, he's trying to do something that doesn't involve kickbacks. And it's taking him a long time. And when I, sh I, I showed him this, he said it made his day. Because he's also struggling to get going with his IX, but he believes in it. So I also think that if, you know, a business, somebody who's in business, um, it was said earlier, you know, it's okay if it takes a while. Sometimes it could be worth it. Okay, number five. Active funds root problem isn't underperformance. Um, if you really dig, underperformance is a symptom of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is not sharing economies of scale, not throwing a bone to your own investors. And so if you look at this chart, I showed it earlier. When, when the active, when Vanguard finally and passive started to see inflows, that's when active started to come down. But during that time, they took in a ton of money, and it probably would have been a good time to give a little back. Now, again, I wouldn't have done it. I admit that. I would have sponsored the sports stadium, given myself a raise, hired a bunch of new people, expanded overseas. Uh, I would have had a big, great Christmas party. I would have done these things. I'm human. Um, again, that's why the book isn't, isn't on me. Uh, <laughs> so this is a fascinating thing. This is a little wonky, but percent fee versus dollar fee. This is the most underreported story in the entire financial world. Percent fees can never change. And you're like, well, they've always, they, at least they didn't raise fees or they lowered them a little. But if the more assets you get, the dollar fees are ridiculous. It's almost, I'm almost surprised this is legal. So even Bogle said, it's okay if you charge 1% if you're starting out. You need to keep the lights on, right? 1% of say uh, $10 million is $100,000. Okay, how about 1% of 5 billion? That's 50 million, okay. But then you get to 50, uh, 40, 75 billion, you're now making 750 million or a billion per year per fund. And do you really need to do that? Is the fund really requiring that much extra money? PIMCO got sued for this, and the whole lawsuit was about dollar fees. That's when Bill Gross got the payout of like $275 million in, in just for one year. And they sued him, and in that lawsuit, I really, it enlightened me to dollar fees. Bogle really made the case for dollar fees, but it, it didn't really work. That said, putting a cheap index fund on the market helped people kind of figure it out, but I'm still surprised this isn't a bigger deal. Um, and the problem is the Steve Jobs rule. I think in general in business, if Active had just cannibalized themselves a little bit, they'd be in much better shape. They wouldn't have got so utterly disrupted. Steve Jobs came out with the iPod in 2001. I think it was 400 bucks, held 1,000 songs. Then the next one comes out, it's cheaper and holds more songs and it's even smaller. And that's why Apple rules, right? They kept doing the Steve Jobs rule. So I think this is something that Vanguard did perfectly. Now, this is partially the mutual ownership structure doing it, but I'd, I'd say, I might even call it the Jack Bogle rule, but either way, they both were aligned on that. And it reminds me of the music industry. The music industry, there's a great book called How Music Got Free, um, if you're interested. If you replace CD with mutual fund and MP3 with cheap index fund, their book almost reads exactly like this industry. The, the MP3, came, the CDs were, as you know, remember you used to spend so much money on CDs. They were all like $16.99. Well, over time, they got cheaper to make. They got to the point where they were 50 cents to make, but they kept the, the charging $16.99. So the MP3 comes out, and everybody's like, oh my God, I'll go to Napster. I'm never paying you again. Like there was no love for the music industry. And you can see the revenue was cut in half in no time. I mean, the MP3 messed them up. Now, they are coming back a little bit. They're trying to figure out new ways to make money with music and some of it's working. That's what's going to happen here. A bear market will really cut revenue, but then it'll evolve. They're going to figure out new, new ways to service you. Some of those I'll go over in a minute. Um, and it's interesting that Active didn't realize this because all their whole job is to study companies, businesses, trends, disruption, and this is like something that they would probably not invest in, but they didn't totally apply it to themselves. So in my opinion, had they lowered fees, they would have banked goodwill, and their beat rates would have gone up, we know, because if it's cheaper, and they would have fended off the Bogle effect big time. But they didn't, and they just got totally plowed, especially in 2008 on. It's kind of like game over. Here's the thing, though, that's different about asset management versus, say, uh, music or any industry. You can make more money and lose customers. It is a really good deal. So here's a chart showing the active-passive market share. 
And you can see that passive was a blip in 1993. It was like 2%. Now it's 40%. But the pie itself has grown like tenfold. So the, if, as long as the pie itself oversees your share shrinking, you make more money. So that's why Jack said, the index revolution has claimed no victims. And this is something I try to warn my colleagues about. I'm like, there is a, you know, to quote Bob Dylan, a hard rain is going to come here. Because even though you have all these assets, they're hollow assets. A lot of the customers are gone. So it's the hollowing out that once we have a bear market and people are in there stuck in there for tax reasons, we're going to see trillions usher out of these funds quickly. This year, we could see a trillion out of active. Right now, I think it's 700 billion year to date. But as I said in the book, there will be blood. And I think what's going to happen is there'll be a huge consolidation. This is the banking industry. Looks like an NCAA March Madness chart, right? A uh, lot of consolidation. I mean, look at that. So they went from like 30 to 4. I think we're going to see something similar with fund companies and asset managers. I think it's going to be like the airlines. There'll be BlackRock, Vanguard, and then like a collection of like State Street, Invesco, and like 10 other companies. And they'll do like 70% of all the service uh, for, for investors. And then there'll be like hundreds of companies that just do specialty work and make up the other 25%. I could be wrong. That's my prediction. Now, I brought this up in my last interview with Jack, and he went even further. He said there'll be a mass mutualization of the whole industry. In other words, all these companies are going to be forced so desperate somehow that they're going to convert to Vanguard structure. Of the 50 people I interviewed, nobody agreed to that. That said, if I asked you about stuff in 1991, I don't think anybody would have agreed that we'd get here. So I put it in the book. I don't know if I agree with it, but it's something to think about. Uh, number six, the bigger passive gets, the more active active will become. This is a byproduct of the Bogle effect that Bogle would not have liked, okay? So portfolios are changing. The core has now been totally taken over by cheap beta and kicked out all of the closet indexing active funds from the 90s. So you have 85% cheap beta, but then people are a little bored by that, frankly. I know I'm in the bogleheads, and probably half of you here are fine being bored, but a lot of people want to have a little something exciting to lay on top, like hot sauce. This is where you have firms like ARK, thematic ETFs, uh, crypto, call options. These are things to kind of distract yourself while the 85% grows like a tree. And so what we find is when you look at the ETF flows, most of it goes to dirt cheap beta, but there's a good chunk that goes to shiny objects. The middle is where there's no, it's a no man's land now, and that's where a lot of those legacy active funds live. Um, so ironically, Kathy Wood is, is somewhat a byproduct of Bogle's life work, which I know, um, you know, <laughs> that is weird to say, but I know Bogle would hate that. I, I, I know that. He, he, in one of his books, he spends like a whole chapter just bashing uh, high-flying mutual funds, one after another. Um, he's like, look at this, look at this, and, and it's all this ones that went up and came down. ARK probably would have made that chapter if it, if it had existed then. That said, ARK isn't seeing outflows. Why is that? And that is a big study of ours because I think people who own ARK, they actually want a little crazy. What if she's right? You know, what if there's robo-taxis all over? I don't want to miss out. Plus, I already got all the serious investor stocks covered. So that's why the fundamental analysts who see things like theme ETFs and Kathy Wood, they get, they drives them crazy. They're like, I, I got my CFA. How is this person getting more flows than me? She doesn't know anything. And I'm like, well, the problem is the stuff you, the funds you sell, people use Vanguard for. Your competitor is Vanguard, not Kathy Wood. Her competitor is crypto, you know, lottery tickets, options. Um, and this is why we see the number of holdings in new ETFs has plummeted. They are all being designed for max pop potential. So what I think is going to happen to Active is they're all going to slowly shift over to the best 20 ideas, the best 30 ideas. And that's going to be a complement to the cheap beta. Anything trying to replace cheap beta, I'm bearish of. I'm bearish on ESG. I'm bearish on DI, direct indexing. But I am bullish on some of this wacky stuff, which puts me at odds with some of my fellow analysts for this reason. But I do think some of uh, some maybe portfolio managers would be even happier just giving 30 stocks instead of deciding whether Amazon should be 2 or 3% weight today. They can just pick their 20, 30 best ideas. I think they're going to have more fun doing that anyway. I think it's a good uh, evolution. But if you have cheap beta covered, it gives you more 
patience for the volatile stuff, which you do need to be patient with. So it's interesting dynamic we're seeing shift. Uh, and again, this is part of the Bogle effect. Um, and this is why we have our, this is just a fun little side shoot. We have our three C's for ETF success. This is uh, cheap, so you gotta be cheap. This explains basically 99% of all the flows. Cheap, creative, right? High, you know, concentration active or, uh, you know, outcomes like option overlay strategies. So you gotta do something different, put some legwork into it. Or Cabernet, uh, this is the Cabernet lane. This is used by a few companies. This is like basically whining and dining advisors. It's an old school lane, but it still works. There's still a chunk of money that is basically allocated this way. I think this lane will, will slowly die away, but it still exists and that's, those people we study because they have an immunity to the Vanguard effect. It's like, it's like a, a special power. And so we obviously look to see how they can do that. Okay, number seven, Bogle's relationship to ETFs was complicated. My metaphor for Bogle and ETFs is, see the index mutual fund was like his firstborn daughter. And the ETF is like the tatted up bad boy that she married. <laughs> he doesn't like it, but he has to deal with it. And that's, I know, I, every time I met with him and he was on our show and stuff, he just, he couldn't help it. Even if he, he, he didn't say stuff like, well, the broad ones are okay, but, and then dot, 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 and he'd go right in for the kill. Um, so he, he'd throw a bone now and then to ETFs, but he just couldn't get comfortable with them. But what's interesting about Bogle is that he had such a profound positive effect on ETFs. He's half the reason they're so popular. And I found this over and over. Bogle would kind of crap on things that he had such an effect on, like smart beta. He launched the first growth in value, and he'd say, oh, that's awful. And ETFs, you know, um, international, right? So Bogle sort of honed in on like, oh, you just need a total market fund. Everything else is sort of a distraction. So it put him at odds with everything. But the ETF industry is interesting. Not only, here's a chart that shows um, the, one of the big unknown things about why ETFs are so popular. They were really designed to be trading vehicles by Nate Most of the American Stock Exchange. He went to see Bogle and asked them, can we use the Vanguard 500 and have it trade? <laughs> He's like, no effing way. Uh, he, uh, he didn't curse, obviously. But uh, anyway, um, he told Nate Most, they, they actually became friends. He said, look, I, I will never do this. But here's a couple tips on your design and uh, you know, have a, you know, good luck. He goes up to State Street, sells this idea to State Street. So SPY launches in 1993. Now SPY comes out with an expense ratio of 0.20%. That is exactly where that Vanguard S&P 500 ETF or index fund was. Remember, they, it went down slowly. So in 93, it was 20 basis points. They launched SPY to compete. And so if they had launched at 80, ETFs would still be a little trading tool uh, that serves niche purposes. But now it's major big business because it's cheap and it would reach advisors and retail. And Barclays really saw that. And then Vanguard jumped in. Uh, so now the ETF is you know, a phenomenon. It's actually bigger in assets than index mutual funds or TIFFs, as uh, Jack called them, um, traditional index funds. He tried to push that acronym. It wouldn't take, though. Um, he tried so hard, though. Anyway, it was, it was cute. Um, but he, you know, he just thought ETFs traded too much. That was his big problem. And it's ironic is Vanguard's ETFs are now becoming a bigger part of their pie. Index funds still have more money, but you can see how fast ETFs are growing within Vanguard. So I think this is one of the things that put him at odds with his own company over the last 25 years. They launched the ETFs 10 years after he said no, and they, it got more growth, and he just, it wasn't his thing. And he had a lot of, you know, the, first, the second time I walked into his office, first I walk right in and he goes, did you read the article? And it was an FT column he wrote, trashing ETFs. And he goes, that got me in a lot of trouble around here. <laughs> he goes, there, <laughs> anyway, um, I, I got it, like who, who does that? Like it, he's on his own, he's on Vanguard's campus sort of dropping bombs <laughs> on different areas of Vanguard. Oh, it's just classic. Anyway, um, it's like the founder got in trouble at his own company. I just, the, the whole dynamic was like dysfunctional in a way. Okay. Um, and now Vanguard is poised to be the biggest U ETF issuer um, in the United States and thus the world. Well, not the world. BlackRock has a little more of a lead, but this is the US. So you can see they've gone from almost nothing to 30% market share and they're headed up quickly. Uh, they take in um, almost 30 to 50% more than BlackRock's ETFs every year now. 
And so they're going to be the biggest. But you have to think, if they if Vanguard didn't launch ETFs, you know, not as many people might have low cost indexing. So I think you have to give the ETF a little bit of credit. Um, and I think I asked advisors, are you ever tempted to trade just because you can trade? Do you? And he, most of them say, no, I'm OK. I can control myself. Jack worried that could, because you would could trade, you would. But I don't know if a lot of that's happening. I think what he worried about was all the turnover in these ETFs. Like if you take the assets and divide by the volume or vice versa, you get how much it trades per asset. And Spider trades a lot. He's like, oh my God, everybody's trading. But that isn't necessarily retail investors. That's a one like blunt number. It could be like three big institutions and all the retail people are just sitting there. And I would say this to him and he would somewhat admit it, but he just, again, he thought these were trading tools and he, uh, as you could say, he thinks 3% turnover is pushing the envelope. Um, by the way, he had this great, <laughs> one of his books, I can't remember, he had this like John Lennon type quote where he's like, imagine a day when the stock market lay fallow, silent, all day long. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a lyric. It sounds, I was thinking like him at a piano. Um, and so I thought they should have a Jack Bogle day where the market's open, but nobody trades. Um, but the truth is some ETFs trade a lot, some don't. Vanguards don't trade a lot. He took some comfort in that, I think. And then like you look at the pro shares, that turnover is 10,000% a year. Uh, he saved his most colorful savagery language for leverage ETFs and themes. It was great. I put a medley of his greatest hits in the book. Um, and he was really bothered by all the launches. One time I was in his office and he had the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, where they list all the stocks and, and ETFs. And he's looking at all the ETFs and he's like, what in the hell's going on here? Because there was just so many ETFs. He's like, how could there possibly be so many index funds? And it's true. They've taken the index and they've really mutated it as Rick Ferry calls it spindexing. And there's not, I mean, again, there's nothing he can do about it. This is the way the market's going. Um, that said, I do think there's uh, ETFs are a big tent. There are basically low cost, low turnover ETFs that take in a lot of money. The shiny stuff gets a lot of press, though, but you know it does exist for the reason I mentioned. And here's his, um, you know, I love this quote. He felt like Dr. Frankenstein <laughs> when, he, when he woke up in the morning and all these ETFs launching. Um, I wonder, <laughs> he would have loved some of the recent ones, the inverse Jim Cramer. Actually, he might have liked that one. Um, okay, this is funny. So in our podcast, we interviewed him about six months before he passed away. This is the last interview. And he's 89, right? And this is just a great story. At the end of our podcast, we ask all the guests, what's your favorite ETF ticker that isn't your own? Or Because the tickers are fun, right? ETF tickers are kind of cute and whatever. So some people say like Tan, Moo, right? Bogle sits there for three seconds and goes, C-R-Z-Y, which isn't a ticker, okay? <laughs> That's him basically like ETF suck. I mean, <laughs> but knowing the ETF industry, that will be a ticker at some point. Okay, number eight, most passive worries are overblown. I'll go through this pretty quickly. This is a little bit, you know, um, I, going into passive worries is a great way to look at the big picture, where all the money is, what's going on. So I, I put this in here for that because it's an interesting study. So this is a look at the ownership of the U.S. stock market. Yes, Vanguard takes in a lot of money, but ETFs and mutual funds collectively own 40% of the stock market. Households own another 40 but of the ETF and mutual fund 40%, only half's passive. So you're only looking about 20%, even less, 18%. Okay, maybe some institutions have passive SMAs. Let's go to 25. So we'll say 25% is passive. I asked a lot of people, what do you think passive could get to before there's a problem? So like most people, uh, like Bogle said 75% roughly. Um, Gus Souter said 80. Bert Malkiel, when he said 95 he went all the way. He said, as long as somebody is trading, there will be a price and we're good. So I don't know. I don't know where I stand on this, but I think 25% isn't that bad. And look, when you see uh, company news come out, a lot of times stocks go up and down quickly, right? Earnings, this is a chart of GE after it had a bad earnings. It went down like 50% over the next 18 months. That's a chart of the flows into passive funds that own GE. And so you can see it was able to go down even though the flows were there. So I don't think passive is the tail wagging the dog at all. That said, would GE have gone down a little more if there wasn't the passive bid? Probably. So I think passive could be a little buffer in sell-offs because the flows are always coming in. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But anyway, as long as the stocks go up and down, that passes my sniff test for an efficient market. 
Um, this is a chart showing the S&P 500. People think passive is like this static thing, but it's, it's not really passive. All these indexes, there really is no such thing. The S&P 500 has rules to get in, and they, they kick companies out. They let new ones in. Um, there's a human committee that can have overrule, like oversight of everything. So it's, it's almost like just very low turnover active in a way. So I think some active is more passive than it looks, some passive more active. I just think all this is about how are you going to own these big blue chip companies and just do it in an efficient way. I don't really think there's this black and white issue between active and passive. So I think that that nuance is important and people forget that. Now, one of the biggest things that is legit isn't passive or indexing growth, but it's the growth of two companies, Vanguard and BlackRock. They have so much market share of passive and ETFs that they're slowly, well, not slowly, but they're already now the top owners of all the companies in America. So we just ran a search before I did it this week. Vanguard is now the top owner of 69% of the S&P 500 companies and in the top three owners of the 99%. So they basically have a lot of power and control. And the question is, how does this play out? Right now, they're at 15%, but a company can own a lot. The rule in the books is a fund can't own more than 10%, but their biggest fund only owns 2-3%. So they, they could start another one. The rule was for when fund complexes didn't exist and a company had like one or two funds. So this rule is, is, is dated. So Vanguard and BlackRock could own 40% of companies um, you know, collectively together. And that's a lot of ownership. So what do we do? Do we uh, d democratize the voting? That's probably a good idea. I personally think Vanguard will probably get regulated. You know, I have a note and a theme that I say, which is the only thing that can stop Vanguard at this point is regulation. Even their customer service, as, as bad as some of the stories are, I don't think that'll do it. I, I think the government will probably come in at some point and say, look, you're going to have to just stop. But this is why I called the book The Bogle Effect and not The Vanguard Effect. Because even if Vanguard goes away, the, the ship has sailed. You can get low-cost funds now everywhere. So you don't even really need Vanguard. Like, it's the training wheels could go off. We're now in this, like, investor utopia. Everybody has low-cost funds. So Bogle is, is having that is, impact is a little bigger than Vanguard. And speaking of Buffett, I asked Buffett this very question. I said, how big can passive get before you would worry about it? And his answer, this is his exact email, so you can see how he writes emails. I don't, it's like everybody else, I guess. Um, maybe I'm just showing off that I got an email from Warren Buffett. That's probably more like it. Index funds continue, if index funds continue to grow, there will be a public policy issues down the line, but that's a subject for another day. But right above it, I asked him, do you still recommend to retail investors to use an index fund? And he said, absolutely. So as long as he's going to continue to recommend and he says it's down the line, I kind of fall in this camp. But I, I do think this is probably the one legit issue of passive that will become a huge political football and ultimately regulated. Okay, number nine, cheap index, a cheap index fund is way undercredited for improving investor behavior. So there's all this stuff on behavior and psychology. There's books written on this stuff. And it's all like teaching you about your brain and what you shouldn't do. And it's really interesting stuff. Don't get me wrong. But it's easy to write this when you have a cheap index fund. You, it, imagine that didn't exist and you're only in an underperforming active managed fund that charges like 80 basis points, way harder to behave. And we know this because we've seen the flows in other bear markets. But index fund investors, they never move. And my theory on this, and here's a, a chart showing the past uh, times we've had negative markets, you can see the flows into ETFs and index funds are positive. They're strong. Active sees more outflows. Index fund investors, in my opinion, have just resigned that this is the best deal they could possibly get. What am I going to do? Leave this and go to some fund who happen to do well in this market, but I know they won't do it in the next. Ah, screw it. So you just get to just sort of happily resign. And that is a gift. So just introducing a cheap index fund or something worth holding to, I think doesn't get enough credit in the behavioral, the study of behavioral finance. Um, and Vanguard's flows during 2008 show this. This is amazing. Every month they saw inflows. Even October, when the market was down, another 17%. And so this bodes well for their growth. And this is part of what taking the hard road early by Jack paid off. He purposely wanted the right investors, didn't want short-term money. And so constantly putting this off, you, f you get investors. Also, one other thing here, by not paying brokers, the people who would come to Vanguard 
would be kind of heads up people because you'd have to think this through and go, actually, this makes sense. I'm going there, right? You had to actually go there. So the core Vanguard is very heads up, astute, educated, smart investors like all of you, right? And I actually think Bogle might be undercredited in starting the RIA movement because you had to leave the brokerage to become an RIA to use Vanguard because they wouldn't pay the brokerage. So the whole RIA movement is, I think, in concert with the rise of passive. They kind of feed off each other, I think. Um, and Michael Lewis, who I interviewed, I was surprised Michael Lewis never wrote about this. I, I read in an interview, he was a Vanguard investor uh, since the 80s. And I was like, I can't, he's interested in all these Wall Street tales and stories. This is like the greatest story ever told. And he just hasn't ever written about it. So I called him. Uh, he took my call, luckily. Um, and he was a great interview. But halfway through, he started asking me questions. I was like, wait a second, don't steal my idea. Um, this quote to me sums up the great resignation and the knockoff effect, which is, again, you can't measure this, which is people get to just live their life now. You don't have to be glued to your monitor. He said it made him a better writer, and he's a great writer. So this is, again, th these are, again, the residual effects are just astonishing when you start to measure them out. But I think this is the mindset of your average uh, Vanguard investor right here. Now, it is hard to behave sometimes. L let's, this is a hard year to behave this year, right? The news loves to sell negativity. I know because I do it. <laughs> a negative headline gets like five times the reads. It's like, oh, it's okay. So we definitely put out more negative headlines. And that's just, we have different goals than, than, an, than an investor does. And you need to know that. So here's a chart showing the S&P and a bunch of negative headlines. You can see it's very easy to do that. But it, this is how index fund investors have really been able to put this off. And some of the advisors who I call big long advisors, they've been very good about turning this stuff around and, and doing judo on these negative headlines and really working their investors to stay put. And we've seen the residuals. Um, the other thing that you see is FOMO, right? CNBC does this thing where they'll just look at crypto or if you invested in this in like 1945, you would have been a millionaire. Um, this is what I call the 95-5 phenomenon which is that 95% of the media coverage is on stuff that would make up 5% of your portfolio. This is my E equals MC squared, okay? So behold, uh, I'm proud of this. Because um, I actually look, VTI is like the most popular ETF, right? If you search news mentions, it's like a flat line. And it's, it's weird, isn't it? Um, um, but the stuff that comes out, it's more flashy, it gets more of the press. So people, um, again, FOMO is a big thing. And now we have free trading. So this is a chapter I did that was just looking at the art of doing nothing and behavior because it isn't easy to behave, but an index fund is a great uh, weapon to behave better. And now when trading's free, um, you know, we saw what happened, right? We have the Robin Hood army. And I've got to say, I would love to hear Bogle's comments on the whole meme thing. Oh my God, they would have been epic. <laughs> His head might have exploded, I think, though. Um, so the, you see the rise. This is the percent of all equity trading made up by retail investors. Look at that spike. It went from 10% to 24%. And then it went down. Why? <clears throat> the market did stop working. They stopped being geniuses because now it's hard to make money, right? So I think that chart's going to go down further. And those people are going to go to Vanguard and cheap indexing. I think the Robin Hood meme army thing is just young people with nothing to do and just wanting to have fun. Um, and I, I actually talked to some of the meme traders on this, and I pushed them on this, and they admit it. They're like, yeah, I, it's just for fun. Anyway, I think they're going to grow up. They're going to realize losing money is not that fun, and they're going to ultimately go to what we all have right here. So then the next generation will probably come in during a bull market, and they'll go crazy. I'm Gen X. I went a little crazy in the late 90s. And you know, then you get responsibilities. You, don't, you just can't bet your money on all this stuff. So I think they're going to discover what I, what Dave Nadig calls Bogle's hack, which really is sort of loosely, uh, you could use the metaphor from the movie War Games, where the computer kind of comes to the conclusion that nuclear war is a strange game. The only winning move is not to play. And I think that's what these younger investors will come to that conclusion. Uh, because you play long enough, you realize it's very difficult. So I do think you're going to find that. So I don't think that meme thing is really that big of a deal. Um, all right, number 10, let's get on with this. Um, the Bogle effect is much bigger than Vanguard and it's only just beginning. So again, I, th I probably could have sold more copies if I called the Vanguard effect. 
So give me some props for taking the, the harder road. I even had a colleague who introduced me, and he goes, she goes, this is in Bloomberg. She goes, author of The Boggle Effect. And I was like, no, I did not write a book about a board game. But people don't know that name enough. But I, I thought, you know, they should. But really, the, the material dictated this. And it's because, again, Vanguard could go away. They could lose their, they could lose, they could be regulated. They could misstep. Who knows? But the Bogleheads, you know, this whole thing is, is almost like bigger than that. And I think that the name, I'm, I'm happy I named it that. Um, so look, where are the places this is playing out? Equity mutual funds, clearly, the hurricane is right on top of them. Trillions just moving, right? So we'll say that's the first victim. Bond funds have been um, more, they've held up better. Bond managers and bond, active bond mutual funds, you can see, unlike equity, they've actually seen inflows most of the last 10 years. Um, this year, seeing outflows, but largely because the market's so brutal. But this, come, this is an interesting dynamic between bond managers and stock pickers and how they're viewed by advisors. Here's the best metaphor I could come up with. For some reason, advisors think bond managers are like physicists. You know, they talk about duration and convexity. They eat cereal for dinner. You know, they're like, oh my God, I got to give this guy money. But then they, on stock pickers, they just think, oh, this guy doesn't know anything. There's all these people covering Amazon. So I do think over time, part of the reason the bond managers are so revealed and there's a mystique is their indexes, their benchmarks are very bad. They're very easy to beat. I think indexing will eventually grow and the benchmarks will get better and investable and we will see the bond funds start to grow more on the passive side. So I think that's one other area we'll see this play out. We'll also see it play out in the advisory space. Now the advisory, this is Vanguard's advisory assets, 250 billion, a lot of that's Vanguard investors, but I would look out for this. This is also Betterment, right? Low cost advice. I sometimes wonder if advisors, some of them, not all of them, are making the same mistake that active fund managers did in the 90s with not sharing the economies of scale. Because remember, if they get 1%, they've seen their pie grow dramatically over 10, 20 years. So I would urge them to you know, bank some goodwill now before this freight train you know, comes close to you. Because Vanguard, I mean, even Tim Buckley said, we are going after you. I mean, he literally called a shot like Babe Ruth. So I think you're going to you know, see a lot of disruption in this area. I asked Bogle about the advisory business. I said, what do you think is going to happen? He said, it's going to get more professional. It's going to move to hourly and flat fee. He thinks the whole percent fee is going to go away eventually. But in his books, he's torn on advisors. He's like, if you do planning and stuff, I think that's a good idea if you use passive. But if you're picking active funds, I don't think that's a good use. So he was mixed on it. But um, he also liked the fact that people went right to Vanguard and didn't even use an uh, intermediary. Um, OK, international has been slower. Uh, right now, the passive boom is really more big, biggest in the US. Japan's really big, because that's because of the Bank of Japan buying ETFs. But the further right is the percent passive, right? We think that whole chart over the next 10 years will move to 70%. So all of it's just going to go over that way as the plumbing and the architecture changes and the word gets out. I think over time, advisors are going to move more to fee-based. Uh, I, I knew it because I, I talk to international advisors all the time. There's a lot of them popping up. I highlight a couple of them in the back of the book. In the back of the book, I have a section called, um, I actually forget what I called it, but I think it's called Carrying the Torch. Because some, uh, some, I asked a lot of people I interviewed, will there be another Bogle? Or who is the next Bogle? Every, <laughs> every single one said, there will never be another Bogle. I mean, it was across the board. So I said, okay, there's no new Bogle. Here's people doing Bogleish things. And I highlighted a, lot of, uh, a couple international advisors because it's harder over there. It's like it was here in the 90s. Um, and then here's just a little shout out to the Bogleheads. Um, this is from the first ever Bogleheads podcast, which Rick Ferry did. Great podcast. That first podcast is great. I got uh, you know five or six juicy nuggets from my book from that one episode. He loved the Bogleheads. I just thought I'd show this to you because you're here, and you know this is why you're here. Um, and he thought it was a huge advantage to have the Bogleheads. And obviously, you know, I talked to some people who are even using other services. But again, the whole idea here is that Bogleism is not exactly exactly the same as Vanguard. And this is, I think, the point of you know, my book is that the Bogleheads are almost like a, they're all, they have chapters. It's almost like a religion that's spreading, which is why in the beginning of the book, I sort of, I was trying to think of who, is, who could I say Bogle is like to somebody. So in the beginning, I say, he's sort of like a combination of Steve Jobs and Martin Luther. Not King Jr., but Martin Luther, the religious guy for the, uh, the protest. 
Um, because I do think there's a product development thing he did. He literally made products that are on the market that everybody loves. There's a religious aspect that was sort of formed, I think, by his unique um, and a visionary look at low cost. So again, I know this is all pre preaching to the choir, but this is um, you know, really interesting stuff when you dig into it. And I certainly had a, a really interesting time and satisfying time writing this book. The only thing left, there's one big part of this that I had to mention at the end, which is that everything we just mentioned only helps half the country, right? So only half of Americans are even invested. So there's still half that aren't. The, so the big question going forward is how to get them invested. The good news is they'll have these frictionless products or funds to use to get into the market. So I think this is an interesting um, sort of way to end it. And Bogle wrote about the wealth gap. Uh, he was worried about it. And so in some of his books, he you know, wondered what we should do. He had some solutions. Um, but anyway, I think that's the next step. Um, and with that, I will say thank you for your time. That was wonderful, thank you. We've got time for a few questions. Uh, anybody in the audience have a question? And uh, we're gonna put the mic over here. You can come on up and ask Eric. Uh, we've got a few minutes. So if, if you've got some questions, uh, come on up. Yep, come on over. We're competing with the bar. Uh, we're bedtime. Um, thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, you mentioned that you get pushback from non-Boglehead crowds. Which parts specifically are received the most? Yeah, it, it's not direct. Um, it, it's, it's, they're a little afraid to say, hey, this upsets me and pisses me off. Um, I don't like what this guy did. Um, it's, you can just feel it. Uh, this is not good. This is not fun information to share with the asset management industry. That said, um, I, I would argue they probably made too much money over the years. The market grew so much, everybody became filthy rich. And like, I think you have to acknowledge that every industry gets disrupted. So how do you move forward? When we write about Vanguard on the Bloomberg terminal, which you would think Vanguard stories would only work for retail crowds. The hits are amazing. And I was like, why do people care when we write about Vanguard? And really what they're, what they're reading is they're scared shitless. They, they, they realize very much that there's a company out there that's like an Amazon in their world. And so that's a, another reason I know we, we definitely um, see a lot of interest there. I call it like fear reads uh, because they are worried. But yeah, it's not direct. And one thing about Bogle that I thought was interesting was he would pretty, be pretty savage towards everything. E ETFs, believe me, my world, he was savage on pretty, pretty heavily active managers, but he would be friends with a lot of these people. I think he did a good job separating what you do for a living with the person you are. He became good friends with Nate Most. He's friends with Cliff Asnes, who's an active manager. Um, so I think some people also might just feel that way too. Like, yeah, it might hurt my business, but I kind of respect what this guy's doing. Uh, first of all, I love the punk rocker analogy. Uh, so you put a ton of research and time into this book. What was the most surprising conclusion or discovery that you made? It had to be, I mean, I showed you, I showed you all, the, all the really surprising stuff. It had to be the rooting for your market share to a road or the serendipity. Um, and really, the, I, how the Vanguard mutual under, uh, ownership structure was birthed was really hard to understand and then write. I kept giving the book, the early copy of the book to my mom. I gave it to my colleagues, but I also gave it to my mom just to see if like a normal person could just get through enough, even though it's not totally a retail book. And she got hung up on the mutual ownership structure story. She was like, what happened here? Who did what? I was like, so I had to go back many times. And that really, I think was, it was shocking how, how circumstantial and like hanging on by a thread. I, as I said in the book, Nobody's copied the structure in 45 years, even though it's been so successful for this company. For this um, company, and I said because it's it's a freak accident. That's why no one's copied. There's no economic incentive to do it. So it really drove home the circumstance and freak accident nature that had to. It's almost as if the universe kind of wanted it to happen. That's how against the odds it was. And I think that was really rich and interesting and somewhat surprising. 
I didn't know the depth of the story like that. So Eric, fascinating talk. Thank you for being here and sharing. I have two questions for you. First thing is, did Lady Geek allow you back on the forum? Yes, she said, look, we'll give you a second chance. Just don't screw up this time. <laughs> That's great. The second one is, this is a great story, looking at it in hindsight, that this was a freak idea whose time somehow managed to come in this world. Did you, do you see any other such ideas now that you might be willing to predict might happen in the financial world? You know, crypto gets compared to this. Um, I honestly think crypto and DeFi are like really Wall Street all over again. Um, and I talk to my crypto, I see Bogle was the OG of DeFi. And I try to explain this to my crypto friends, they don't buy it, but I'm like, not really. He, he operated completely outside of the system. So, you know, IEX, the Brad Kutsuyama firm, I would just say, think of anybody who's just lonely outside of a system and refuses to pay, play along. That would be the and that would be my metaphor for this. Um, but I I think the crypto community could really learn a lot from this because even though they sell populism, they're all becoming billionaires and hiring movie stars to like do commercials. I was like, be careful you don't reveal how hypocritical that is, and make sure maybe look at something you know. I so saw. I'm also trying to sell books, so I'm trying to tell the whole crypto world, you should read this. But I do think there's a good lesson for people who do want to be disruptors. It's not that easy. And this is a roadmap, in my opinion, for how to be a disruptor long term. It, it's, it's really painstaking. And I think crypto in particular gets pitched as something like this, but it really isn't, in my opinion. Uh, thank you for writing such a great book. And I'm a little bit biased, but I kind of like the title. Um, <laughs> But my question for you is, have you um, heard of a firm yet that will just cap their fees that they're charging in the sense of saying, we're going to make our fees X until we make $20 million in top line, and then we're done. And if asset goes up, we're giving it all back. You mean like break evens? Uh, well, the, or like where they, where they reach a certain point and they lower them? No, in the sense of they're saying uh, it cost us to run twenty million dollars to run this business. Yeah, if we make twenty five million, we're giving five million back. Oh, not really. Um, I mean, if if that exists, let me know because we are this is an interesting topic. We think that would go a long way uh, to develop goodwill with the investor base. Um, I think more so what you're finding now is companies are just trying to come out cheap, like Amer um, DFA and Avantis, and there's these new firms that are actually pricing their active funds pretty cheap. Um, that's one way to go. Um, or again, you can charge more if you're in the shiny object lane, because when you outperform, you double or triple the market. You don't just barely outperform, and people are less sensitive to fees. Um, but no, I, you know, I asked Bogle a lot, like, what what should Active do? And he was like, nothing, just just ride it down to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Savage. Total. I mean, <laughs> um, he was like, look, even if you cut your fees fifty percent. There goes all your margin and nobody's going to buy your fund anyway. So, I mean, yeah, he was savage. Look, I, what can, I mean, I'm just repeating what he said. But if you're an investor out there, even people who, you know, there's a great story from Jason Zweig that most of the active management industry is in Vanguard, which is to me the ultimate compliment. So because they know it's a good deal, it's, it's pretty obvious if you're around this industry. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that might be a decent idea to get out there, but like we've seen ETFs that actually come out with a negative fee. Like we'll actually pay you to come in and then we'll raise it to 10 basis points or something. So none of these gimmicks have really paid off. Bank of New York has zero fee ETFs. Nobody really cares. What you need is low cost and, and the brand name helps. Like, so that's why it's really difficult out there. It's basically BlackRock, Vanguard, and then like everybody fighting over the crumbs. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. This is again, part of the reason I explored this but uh, if, I, if I hear of that scenario, or anybody else knows, tell Andrew, but I haven't heard of it. Andrew, go ahead. Thanks for presenting. Um, the case is so fundamental, like logical, rational, factual, objective. Why do you think the quote unquote, like I'll call them super smart money, so pensions, and endowments, foundations, why aren't they doing more indexing? Whew, okay. Um, my first book, my, The Institutional ETF Toolbox, available on Amazon. Um, I interviewed a lot of institutions. And what I discovered 
there's there's a legit reason and there's a, a not legit reason. The legit reason is institutions have different needs than you and me. They have they have to sort of predict their returns, and I give them that. And some of them have access to some pretty cool private equity and hedge funds, especially the Yales and the Harvards of the world. But everybody else, it's a lot of it's conflict of interest. P institutions love the Yale model because the Yale model is like all alternatives, and you can and all these active managers. They like to use consultants. The consultant recommends the active manager. Then when it doesn't work out, they can blame the consultant who can blame the active manager, and then they'll get a new one. If the, if the CIO said, let's just do like the Vanguard model and do two ETFs, uh, they'll lose their entire staff. They'd probably even say, what do we even need you for? So a lot of it's job security, which is an illegitimate reason, but we all, you know, I can relate to that a little bit. And a lot of it is, David Swenson's book, The Yale Model, really just you know, got into their brains. They think it's like the cool way to invest. They think um, it's an exclusive way to invest. I talked to some institutions who were like, they just like to basically go to these parties or the institutional events and brag about who, which PE manager or hedge fund they got. It wouldn't be as cool to say I have like VTI, right? <laughs> and so institutions are in my book I mentioned here, they're, they've got a, a little bit of immunity to the Vanguard effect. I understand the Yales and the Harvards. What I think the Vanguard model should really penetrate is the smaller and mid-sized institutions who don't have access to this stuff. They don't have really highly educated teams. You don't want the firemen, you know, the firemen's pension of, of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, messing with the Yale model. So I think the, the big, be out, outside of the big ones, they really should look to this. There's been a couple pension and, and endowment people who have moved over um, and spearheaded it. It's become a political football a little bit. Harvard wrote the the Harvard wrote their own university, the class of '69, and said, "You got to get rid of these hedge funds. They're awful. They're too much money just by in index funds." So definitely, there it's starting to percolate. But that that area, there's just a lot of conf there's just a lot of reasons that it's just hard to get a VTI in there. It just that's the best answer I could give you. Someone else might have a, a different answer, but that was my experience talking to them. But what's interesting in my in that first book I mentioned, I go over it, you know, advantages of, of ETFs. And my final advantage is personal usage. I talked to a lot of ETF wholesalers who said they'd go to institutions and the, the CIO would call them back and get all this information. And the ETF person would go, okay, so are you going to invest? Uh, like, I didn't see the money in the funny. Oh, no, it's for my personal account. And so a lot of them admitted to being in Vanguard in their personal account or in low-cost ETFs, the CIOs. But then with the, with the fund, they buy all these high cost hedge funds and uh, alternatives. So I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, I think there's, you know, I don't want to bash them too much because like I said, they have different needs than you and I, but I think they could benefit a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. It's been a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Greatly appreciate you coming out here. Thank you. Well, that concludes our program for tonight. We hope you uh, have enjoyed it. And uh, we will see you tomorrow morning. Breakfast begins at 7 o'clock upstairs, and then the first session begins at uh, 8 uh, a.m. So uh, have a nice evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.